Good afternoon. My name is Susan Robinson, and on behalf of the IMAC Water and Wastewater Committee, I'm delighted to welcome you to what I'm sure will be a very interesting and informative webinar on the UK water industry strategy to achieve net, net zero carbon by 2030. As you may know, the water sector is the fourth most energy intensive industry in the UK, historically accounting for about 3% of total energy usage and contributing around 5 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions a year. At the end of last year, the water industry became the first industrial sector in the UK and one of the first major sectors in the world to commit to a carbon zero future within a decade. Energy use and carbon management is a topic of great interest to us on the Water Committee, and we've been looking forward to holding a seminar in June on sharing new ways to improve the energy performance of existing processes and to integrate new energy efficient technologies in the water industry. Due to COVID, that seminar has now been postponed to next year, so do please keep an eye out for it. We also have recordings of previous Water Committee seminars, including introductions to the sludge treatment technology, inlet screens, and chemical dosing ava systems available from the IMECI website and YouTube. So do have a look at them. Today, we are very fortunate that two of the key people we had invited to our Water and Energy seminar have volunteered to share in this webinar their current work on the UK water industry strategy to achieve net zero carbon by 2030 and a technical case study on the recovery of energy from waste. I'm very pleased to introduce Maria Manizaki, Mott McDonald's lead, technical lead for Net Zero Carbon, who is leading the Water UK Net Zero Carbon Roadmap for an industry transition to net zero by 2030, as well as advising Watercare in New Zealand on their carbon baseline. Maria specializes in carbon management, including energy efficiency and small tail renewable energy technologies and carbon reduction in construction across the infrastructure value chain. She's a member of the UK Green Construction Board and co-authored the Infrastructure Carbon Review, as well as being lead technical author of past 2080 Carbon Management and Infrastructure. Maria is also a visiting lecturer on low carbon infrastructure at Cranfield University. And Priya Stapala, Investment Planning Advisor at Mott McDonald. Priya has a strong technical and regulatory background in water and has provided guidance on cost and carbon management within the infrastructure sector. His particular expertise is in developing regional and national flood strategies, optimizing the production and value of biogas through different end uses, and assessing opportunities to maximize circular economy approaches within the regulatory, regulatory drivers of sludge management across the UK. Maria and Prias's presentation will last for about 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Please would you ask your questions as they come up during the presentation, using the button on your screen so that they can be pulled together and read out at the end. So, Maria and Priyash, over Hi. to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, hopefully, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Maria Manidaki, and uh, say hello, Priyash, my colleague Priyash Zapala. <laughs> We're here on the webinar. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so hopefully you can see the slides. Uh, we're just going to give you um, um, an overview of uh, what we mean by water and energy in the context of the water industry in the UK and the new um, net zero carbon commitment. So we're just going to give you um, some insights from uh, the Water UK net zero carbon project that we're currently working with uh, Water UK and all the water companies. Um, just uh, touching on uh, upon a few of the carbon energy hotspots um, uh, that we have seen in the sector and uh, the required action. Um, and uh, and then Priyash will give uh, a little bit more detail on uh, sludge management as a focus, how it fits to the net zero carbon challenge. And uh, also he's going to go through some of the existing and emerging technologies and trends um, for the industry to consider by 2030 and post 2030. Okay, so um, let me just uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the industry, uh, the water sector industry commitment. So um, this started uh, last year in April where water companies in England uh, pledged uh, to be net zero carbon as a sector by 2030. So we started this project with Water UK, uh, working in Mott McDonald in collaboration with Ricardo uh, to help the industry achieve that. Um, and to do that, we we work we have been working with all the companies to define what net zero carbon means for the water sector 
since it has been the first sector in uh, in the UK economy that as a sector have set this uh, target and commitment. And when we're talking about definitions, uh, we work together to understand what is going to be the emissions boundary, the scope, what types of emissions to be included in that net zero commitment. At the moment, uh, for 2030, uh, companies have been uh, focusing on the operational carbon scope one and some, some scope, scope one, two, and some scope three emissions. Um, capital carbon is obviously a big challenge, and there are active discussions uh, of how to address those post 2030. Um, so basically, uh, the, the essence of this project is that we have been uh, looking at uh, what different decarbonization options uh, the sector should be considering, uh, focusing on the philosophy of the Paris Agreement uh, and also actually the current uh, UK government uh, direction on decarbonization, which is we have to reduce things first, our emissions first, then can we do anything to produce, for example, generate renewable energy and uh, export anything in the wider system? And then uh, once we've done those things, what is uh, what are the types of offsets to uh, offset any small, well, hopefully small residual emissions um, that are remaining? Okay, so I'm just going to um, go to the next slide and I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of uh, the historical picture of the water sector in the UK. So these are um, the historical operational emissions of the sector in the UK um, from uh, 2011 uh, down to our current baseline, which is 2018, 2019. And as you can see, there has been, okay, it's a little bit of a complex graph, but I'll try and make it simple. As you can see, um, the trend has been going down, which is good. Um, the overall uh, reductions, though, have been largely due to the gradual grid decarbonization. And, but companies have done quite a lot of uh, work on their procurement strategies to purchase green electricity uh, that uh, have been reducing their emissions. However, there are other good stories that uh, the use of fossil fuels on site that they're using uh, and the likes of uh, uh, standby generation uh, that they have on site or gas oil for boilers and heat, um, they have been uh, reducing. And uh, the companies have done in the last 10 years quite a lot of work on um, uh, reducing energy efficiency uh, from, um, uh, for example, optimizing pumping uh, regimes, aeration in treatment, and other operational optimization practices. Uh, however, uh, those uh, energy efficiency gains, um, the, the trend has been, if you look at the top uh, uh, blue line that has been going down, um, they have been largely offset uh, by, obviously, population growth and uh, environmental standards that they have to meet that are increasingly being tightened, basically. Uh, however, a very good story uh, so far has been uh, the um, uptake, uh, significant uptake uh, of renewable energy generation uh, that has been quadrupled in the last few years. And this is mainly down to uh, some great incentives that have been in the market, um, either from uh, biogas and CHP to more recently biomethane and uh, the RHI incentives. So just want to give you in the next slide the very big, uh, like a very high level, if you like, hotspots uh, picture of where the carbon is in terms of the operational boundary of the companies. Um, uh, first of all, talking from emissions point of view, uh, the majority of the emissions uh, are carbon dioxide, CO2, uh, and this is in the light uh, blue uh, color uh, in the in the graph and what it shows on the left hand side we have the different emission categories uh, that the companies have been reporting um, for the last 10 years using uh, the carbon accounting workbook which is a standardized uh, method of reporting uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the sector in the uk and you will see that uh, the majority of the emissions are from grid electricity both in uh, water and wastewater uh, but then we have um, quite a few emissions uh, around uh, you will see the methane and the nitrous oxides, the other colors, the orange and the dark blue. These are emissions associated with uh, wastewater treatment and fugitive emissions uh, from sludge. And uh, the rest of the emissions are around um, transport, uh, some admin, and uh, generally energy consumption on site. Uh, you will see there is a negative bar at the bottom, uh, which is essentially um, elect electricity that has been purchased, um, green electricity that has been purchased, and uh, exporting of renewable energy. Now, one of the things that we did as part of the project was uh, this waterfall graph shows 
essentially uh, what would the sector look like if we followed the business as usual trajectory to 2030. So what if we if we repeated all the things we are doing now, uh, up, a certain uptake of renewable energy, energy efficiency, etc. Uh, would it take us to net zero? And uh, you will see that uh, it's not exactly that picture. So, the, so, the, so there are still loads of things to be doing. And this is the message of this slide. So basically, we need to up our ambition uh, in order to become net zero by 2030 and beyond, basically. And moving on to the next slide, I just want to give you a flavor of uh, the decarbonization options that we have been looking for the sector, for different companies uh, to be able to um, assess uh, when it comes to developing their own individual carbon action plans. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have been uh, following the hierarchy of reductions in reducing the emissions and the power, you know, associated from power and all the other activities on site first in the within the operational boundary. Then what we call netting off, which is the language used in the water sector in the UK, which is essentially uh, if we generate more uh, renewables, for example, electricity and energy uh, that we you know, we, we, we don't need to use on site and we can export. These are some of the netting off measures. And then we have also have taken a closer look uh, to the offsetting piece, which, as we said, there will be some residual emissions um, uh, that we're going to have in 2030. So it's about how do we actually uh, look at natural nature-based solution and natural sequestration options to help uh, the sector address those. So when it comes to decarbonization clusters, as we call them, um, for reducing the first category, we have looked, uh, we have been looking at uh, um, reduction measures in uh, power demand through um, more transformational energy efficiency measures. So it's not only about the incremental steps uh, that the sector should be doing already and will be doing, continue to be doing, like uh, pump efficiency, mechanical efficiency compressors, uh, optimization of blowers, aeration systems in wastewater, but also what are the more catchment-wide transformational things that companies should be considering now that some of them could be implemented by 2030, but also beyond. Like, for example, can we have, can we adopt a more, a smarter, more digital enabled approach to managing our catchments in clean and wastewater in the network by linking in more real time the operation of the system to the energy uh, demand. Um, we have been also considering at different levels of water efficiency and demand management. Uh, there has been quite a lot of work, as you know, um, in the water sector around those, including leakage reduction. So it, uh, we're trying to do more analysis on those to see what is, how can companies maximize those efforts that they have already been doing. Um, uh, when it comes to the process emissions, which is a key area of uncertainty at the moment, and the water sector uh, has been doing through a queer, uh, a research project to better understand those nitrous oxide and methanogenic emissions from wastewater that I mentioned earlier, from treatment of wastewater and fugitive emissions. Um, these are, we have been looking at different technologies of how to first monitor these things on site to better understand exactly what is the balance between those process emissions and energy consumption. For example, when you're trying to optimize, I'm not going to go too technical now of how you remove nitrogen from wastewater, but uh, when we're talking about um, optimization um, of uh, different uh, wastewater treatment processes, is there a trade-off between energy consumption versus removing or reducing, sorry, um, process emissions. So we have been looking at uh, monitoring technologies. We have been looking at uh, alternative treatment technologies that uh, something, things like anaerobic treatment or others, uh, other operational practices to reduce the fugitive emissions of sludge. Um, and on top of that, we have also been looking at the transport alternatives, uh, how you move to electric vehicles, hydrogen powered vehicles, biofuel vehicles, but also more rationalization of the types of journeys and efficiency of journeys, uh, especially in the heavy fleet uh, of uh, the companies that we have been looking at. Um, we've also uh, looked at um, alternative on-site fuels. For example, do we need to switch uh, from uh, the existing fossil fuels to the more electrifying uh, way of heating, for example, our digesters to supplement any heat that we cannot generate from CHPs um, or other biofuels in the generators um, and, uh, you know, the, the boilers, etc. 
When it comes to renewable energy, uh, this fits, as I said earlier, uh, both in the reduction and the netting off uh, measures. Uh, we have been looking at um, maximizing uh, the value of biogas, and Prius will go into more detail in a, in a bit on this, um, uh, either through the use through CHP or biomethane or other uses, but also how companies can accelerate the uptake of uh, solar, wind, hydro, existing and proven technologies, um, given the incentives that are in the market, but also more emerging things like where do the water sector fit in terms of hydrogen production, but hydrogen use as well through fuel, cell, fuel cells, etc. Uh, one of the important things under the netting off category is around uh, the taking a systems view in net zero and how can the companies act as uh, exporters of uh, good uh, resources, if you like, uh, that could benefit the wider system in the UK to facilitate their net zero aspirations. And uh, finally, when it comes to the decarbonization options for offsetting, we have been engaging with um, uh, the government, uh, the CCC, and other stakeholders uh, around uh, the practicality of um, um, implementing afforestation, reforestation measures within the water sector boundary or outside uh, in the UK uh, territory when it comes to land use changes. Um, and these are things including peatland restoration, uh, but also other more emerging um, offsets. Right, so uh, the ongoing work that we're doing at the moment, so the roadmap is going to be published uh, later in the autumn, uh, but at the moment we have been looking and assessing the cost, uh, co-benefits and deployment rates uh, of all these decarbonization clusters uh, in order for us to construct the pathways to net zero for the sector. And uh, we have been having key discussions with um, a lot of stakeholders actually in the industry and other sectors as well um, on uh, what are the key enablers to help the companies reach net zero by 2030 and how all these things align with the key milestones, regulatory milestones, like we call the business planning cycles, such as the next price review in 2024 and 2029. And what are the key things we need to be starting doing now uh, for a post-2030 um, to meet our post-2030 ambitions, such as uh, ways for um, uh, accelerating the deployment of more emerging technologies or looking at the capital carbon that we talked about and um, other issues. Um, finally, I would like to uh, basically um, summarize uh, the outputs of uh, the roadmap. Um, it's important to note that there are two levels of detail here in terms of outputs. So one is the actual roadmap, which is going to be uh, a, a more high level and easily digestible document uh, where we're going to set uh, the context uh, that I mentioned, the definition of net zero, the principles, you know, the scope boundary. Um, we're going to uh, delve a little bit more into the historic reductions. Uh, to definitely acknowledge um, the work that water companies have been doing in the last 10 years in the UK to reduce their emissions. And uh, it will include more detail on the pathways to net zero, looking at all the different criteria and uh, analysis uh, of the decarbonization clusters um, linked into the different pathways. Um, we, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have more clarity on the enablers to net zero, so it's important uh, for um, the different stakeholders in the water sector to be um, to, 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 to have a common, if you like, denominator of what needs to happen as a sector to meet that aspiration. Most importantly, if you look on the right-hand side, um, we're going to provide, uh, a, if you like, some water company guidance because as I said this is a roadmap a sector roadmap where individual companies uh, will be consulting to develop their own detailed action plans for net zero and um, in this one we are working to providing more guidance more practical guidance to help uh, companies how to get those messages from the roadmap into the action plans but what tools they can be using that are available or things uh, frameworks we have developed as part, as part of the roadmap and um, tools can include uh, also softer aspects, not only how you go about assessing the costs and benefits of a technology, 
but softer aspects linking to the enablers, how the companies can align their supply chain to make uh, the transition to net zero. So yeah, and this will include some uh, case studies and obviously the assumptions. So I just don't want to take too much of the time. I think uh, my 15, 20 minutes is up and I would like to um, actually now get on um, uh, with uh, Priyas uh, to, to give us um, the more detailed uh, a deep dive, if you like, on sludge management and how it fits to net zero. There you go, Priyas. Go for it. Thanks, Maria. Not too detailed. It's going to be in that kind of middle period. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of how, in particular, sludge management feeds into this kind of net zero route map for the water sector, looking at the 2030 target, but then also beyond. So giving a kind of view of the current picture, it's about kind of 1.6 to 1.8 million tonnes of oil sludge being treated through the UK, and that's being done through a variety of different technologies, majority through conventional or and advanced anaerobic digestion, and there's still a bit of liming and incineration going on, but that's being slowly phased out um, in favor of kind of anaerobic processes. Um, over 90% of sludge is recycled to land, and particularly agricultural land. The sludge that is considered a high quality as a soil conditioner and a way of recycling nutrients back into the land for agricultural purposes. There are some risks that we can go into a bit later and you know these did managing, but generally it's still considered the best practical environmental approach and provides best cost cost efficient approach as well in terms of recycling that sludge waste. The treatment of sludge produces about just over five hundred million meters cubed of biogas each year at the moment. And the majority of that is put through combined heat and power engines and they produce over 900 gigawatt hours of power per year. And just under 10% is currently injected, is upgraded to biomethane and injected into the gas grid. So that's kind of the positive aspect. The negative aspect of it is there are significant process emissions through the kind of conditioning, transport, and um, short-term storage and treatment of sludge in terms of direct process emissions. So the methane that escapes to refugitive emissions, and the energy associated with transporting sludge as well. So there's an efficiency process to be gained there in terms of how do we minimize those process emissions. Generally advanced treatment reduces the amount of fugitive emissions we get and captures the amount of methane that we produce and general biogas to be able to beneficially reuse that. And the general trend of sludge management in the UK and in Europe generally has been hugely influenced by policy and then financial incentives available through the different end uses of biogas. So, and that was likely to be one of the key enablers in terms of how the sludge management approach and how it aligns to net zero progresses in the future. So when we're considering sludge management and net zero, we can generally break it down into three, three key objectives. One is maximize the production and value of biogas. And what are the options to do that? The second step is minimize the process emissions associated with um, sludge management. And then three, as we'll see in terms of as the net zero capability and understanding grows, net zero is always part of a system. At the moment, power in terms of grid electricity might be the most valuable thing to recover. In the future, that might shift towards green gas and kind of decarbonizing heating. And beyond 2030, there may be other more valuable resources that you can recover through sludge treatment. And the sector will need to be adaptable to try and shift its focus to recover what's most valuable as the kind of UK systems picture grows. So in terms of the general building blocks of sludge treatment, start off with sludge conditioning. So it's removed from the wastewater process, and then you try and get it as thick as possible through either a thickening process so that you're trying to reduce the volume, reduce the water content that you're transporting to more centralized treatment areas. So trying to get it to just under 10%, somewhere between 6 to 10% to thickening and then dewatering greater than 15%. And there's lots of different technologies there, but that's a definite efficiency stage where trying to transport thicker, fresher sludge to get it into the treatment as soon as possible to maximize the biogas that we can generate, but also reduce the amount of emissions associated with transporting that sludge. And then kind of there's often, especially during the advance in advanced processes, the pre-treatment stage, this is generally focused on maximizing the hydrolysis 
So the breakdown of starch to maximize the amount of methane can then be produced in the later start of the start of the process during the stabilization phase. So large anaerobic tanks either through mesophilic or thermophilic um, digestion processes, or you can stabilize through kind of lime treatment, so dosing of lime or taking longer retention times, composting, aerating, that kind of stuff. But generally the UK is focused on the digestion aspects. And then again, there's another dewatering stage to try and reduce again the volume. And then that, so that can be recycled to land. Um, other areas where they're not recycling to land, such as parts of Northern Ireland, you then go through a drying phase to get kind of greater than 80% um, dry solids content. And then in the future, you're kind of seeing more advanced conversion technologies being implemented, not necessarily too much in the UK, if there's, again, Northern Ireland still do incinerate a lot of sludge, but there's also the use in kind of cement kills, but this is where the application of to land is either restricted or isn't possible due to other uses, other, and therefore you're trying to minimize the volume as much as possible and recover any energy from that through an advanced conversion process. So, in terms of the UK picture, the most common kind of variants are get raw sludge from a wastewater process, go to the conditioning phase, then the majority of sludge is treated through an advanced process where you either get a thermal hydrolysis process or a biological hydrolysis process. So either it's kind of heating and pasteurizing to a high temperature or using kind of biological enzymes to get a greater level of hydrolysis in the early stage of the sludge treatment to then go through a mesophilic digestion process where you produce your the majority of your biogas and then you dewater and take to land. Again, it's the combination of a pretreatment and the typical digestion, conventional digestion process that's referred to as an advanced anaerobic digestion. So when we're talking about from a net zero picture, there's still a significant proportion of sludge that's conventionally digested. So one of the things that we've been looking at is what is the possibility of maximizing the amount of sludge that we can get through um, advanced digestion processes and is that by either upgrading current plants to advanced digestion or greater centralization of treatment to put more sludge through existing advanced digestion processes. One of the things that we're looking at is also increasing the amount of um, raw substrate that we have. So mixing, um, let's say, household food waste as there's a drive in terms of UK to set, get greater separation of food waste to prevent that going to um, landfill. So one of the things that we're looking at is what are the options for alternative substrates to be incorporated within um, existing sewage sludge digestion plants and there's some barriers there in terms of environmental permitting regulations and what can be considered kind of end of waste categories and that's some of the, one of the barriers that we're looking at if that were to be removed there's potential to increase the amount of biogas that the sector itself produces and therefore increase the amount of energy it produces so looking at the advantages of advanced anaerobic digestion and it's kind of the trend that's gone through the sector is that moving to more advanced processes in terms of digestion and that it's one of the i suppose what we're seeing is the easiest step changes to take in terms of current conventionally digested sludge to minimize um, process emissions, but also maximize the volatile solids reduction, which then increases biogas production, but then also reduces the volume that you're then recycling to land. It increases the dewaterability of sludge so that you're again transporting less sludge to then be transported to recycling to land, improves the product quality. So it turns it into a material that's more stabilized more like soil and it can improve the soil quality on the agricultural land that it's um, recycled to. It has a higher pathogen kill and that's really important in terms of maintaining the security of the recycling to agricultural land, land banks. Obviously, there's the idea of transfer of pathogens into the food that's grown on it and those kind of bits and therefore getting that higher quality product with a higher pathogen kill is important in terms of maintaining confidence that recycling of sludge to land is safe. Um, again, more stable product means lower odor. There's lower greenhouse gas emissions, not only through the treatment process itself and capturing more of the biogas, but also once you recycle it to land, because there's less, um, more volatile solid destruction having already occurred, it's a less volatile product. Therefore, there's less emissions being um, emitted once you recycle to land. 
Um, the pretreatment stage also increases because it reduces the volume of sludge to greater volatile solids destruction. You can get more capacity through the same size digesters. The disadvantage is that it does require quite a high upfront capital cost and it's a more complex process to operate in a, um, what do you call it? Compared to a conventional digestion process, it's more complex to operate well, but it is being done quite regularly across the UK. So I just want to go into, in terms of the, the kind of short and medium term, most common uses of biogas. So currently just over 75% is put through combined heat and power engines where it generates power. So you do not, you're not relying on grid imports as much and you get renewable obligation certificates depending on when your CHB was registered. You also recycle that heat back into the process, particularly for kind of advanced processes that are using um, thermal hydrolysis. That heat can be recycled back into the process and reduces the reliance on natural gas in boilers to provide that heat. Um, I think currently just over, just under 60% of the heat generated through CHP is beneficially reused. So that's an area that we know in terms of what we're looking at. If the CHP were to continue to be the priority way of using biogas, that would be an area that we're looking at is different ways of recycling that heat, either on site or exporting it into local district heating networks. Or I know there's other uses in terms of pumping it into greenhouses where there's also carbon dioxide produced from the combustion in CHPs that could also then be pumped into greenhouses and encourage greater growth. Um, the alternative that seems to be a popular kind of route that companies and the government seem to be promoting is upgrading biogas into biomethane. So removing the CO2 from the biogas and getting a product that's about 98% methane. You inject a bit of propane into that and then you can either inject it into the grid to provide green gas into the grid and therefore that can be used by others that are using the gas grid can go straight into boilers to heat processes again. And otherwise, the alternative uses that we're looking at is compressing that biomethane and it can be used in a multiple different uses, particularly for transport fuels or other kind of storage of that fuel to use elsewhere. One of the key enablers here is in terms of there's been renewable heat incentive, which runs out in April next year. And there's a current consultation on the green gas support scheme. So the level of that support scheme and the size of plants that will um, qualify for that will be one of the big aspects of whether there'll be a larger shift towards um, biomethane to grid. And that kind of ties in with the fact that the renewable obligation certificates are no longer available for new CHPs. And I believe all renewable obligation certificates for current CHPs are gonna run out by 2028. There is some constraints to how much gas you can inject into grid at different points and whether the current sites of um, anaerobic digestion plants are in the areas that are suited to um, injecting into the grid. But however, being able to compress it and transport that fuel quite easily and use it for different uses is clearly a benefit. And there's the incentive and the financial use for that. And it supports the decarbonization of heating that is going to be one of the hard to decarbonize sectors for the UK as a whole. Yep, and then going beyond 2030, there's numerous research areas where you're looking at the four, the main focus areas are how can we maximize energy recovery and what is that energy that we want to be producing? Looking at better nutrient recovery. So recycling sludge to land does recycle nutrients, but is there a way to do that in a safer way that reduces the amount of runoff that you get from uh, sludge to land? There's also the possibility of recovering biopolymers, so bioplastic and platform chemicals. And just some examples of this are, you can get the Amersfoort plant in the Netherlands. This is recovering, it's got an advanced digestion process, recovers elect, um, biogas, goes through CHPs, produces energy. The liquors are then put through a demon process and they produce something called crystal green, so fertilizer. This has been a slow release fertilizer that can be applied to land and it doesn't have the same issues with leaching as you do to direct sludge application to land. 
and is a much more higher value product that can be sold and has a market. Um, this has been around for a while, so there's still issues with how much of a market there is and what value you can get out of it. And as always, there needs to be a market for the products that you're recovering and the resources that you're recovering. And this will be one of the key drives into what is focused on recovering in the future. It's also the biorefinery concept, so the Billund Wastewater Plant in Denmark, looking at integrating organic household waste, industrial waste, and wastewater sludge into a single digestion facility that can then recover much more biogas than just sludge alone. It has a kind of system up front that kind of gets a called optimized mix of the different substrates coming in to maximize the energy produced. It then also looking at kind of bolting on additional process to this is the fact that looking at the research, the basis of most of these kind of advanced recovery processes and trying to get to more circular economy processes are bolt-ons to exist existing uh, conventional and advanced digestion processes. So it doesn't look like you're going to be, um, by going to an advanced process, it doesn't mean that you're precluding yourself from ever recovering these additional processes. It would just be up additional bolt-ons and adaptations to the existing process. And the increase in technology such as Nerida and um, just the general fact that you do get PHAs um, produced in sludge allows for biopolymer recovery. And this has been trialed in the Netherlands again. And they've identified kind of particularly through specific types of wastewater sludge that there is the possibility to cost effectively recover biopolymers. I'm not going to try it yet. Polyhydroxyalkanate. And they've actually got a commercial arrangement with a local supermarket to purchase the first small amount of bioplastics they produce for um, carrier bags. So it's one of those kind of things of looking in the future if there's an alternative need to recover a different pollutant or kind of work on a different route where all of the other kind of heat and um, power has been decarbonized, there's the opportunity to recover other valuable products that may not be considered at the moment. And another example of this is looking at platform chemicals. So lots of different pro uh, steps are taken through the kind of advanced digestion, digestion process, and there's the potential to inhibit at different stages. So at the moment, the process is focused on producing as much methane as possible, but there's the potential to um, inhibit the process at the hydrogen production stage and try and recover biohydrogen through the digestion process itself. Or there's a value in platform chemicals, so the acetic acids, and they're useful in kind of cleaning products and lots of different other industrial um, chemicals that are produced. And in the future, there might be a higher value in recovering some of these products rather than methane itself. And then that would be a adaptation in terms of where you try and optimize the actual digestion process through to produce these other maximize the production of these other things rather than methane itself. Um, just in terms of things that we need to think about alongside the net zero picture and the recovery of products is sludge also is a sink for the pollutants that we have in wastewater. So generally consider that over 90% of pollutants generally end up in sludge. So looking at the idea of antimicrobial resistance, what, ha what impact does those the anti and AMR bacteria in sludge have well, when it's recycled to land and does that have an impact on the food products and the crops that are grown on there, the PPCPs, so the pharmaceutical products, and does that have an impact when it sludge is recycled to land, and microplastics, again lots of research going into the impact of a lot of microplastics settle into the sludge part of um, wastewater, and then that gets recycled to land. So what the impact does the digestion processes and advanced processes have on the amount of microplastics that are left in sludge when it gets recycled to land? And does that get uptaken into any of the crops? So there's been lots of research and the biosolids application land is still considered safe on the available research. So it's not that it's not, but it's these are the kind of emerging areas that will need to be considered alongside the net zero picture as well. And this is just a graphic showing kind of from wastewater 
the sludge element of what is seen as might end up in land and soil in terms of microplastics. And yeah, that's it for me. Hopefully that was of some use. And um, if there's any questions now, thank you. It was great, Pris. Well done. <laughs> Yeah. I've tried. I've tried to answer some of the questions as they were coming through. Uh, okay. But yeah, also have a look as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then. Yeah. So thank you very much indeed, um, Maria. That was. They were. Those. That was a, a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. Scamper through very very of um, the, uh, <laughs> the 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 implications of zero carbon across the. Across the industry and also um, the applications of it in in sewage sludge. So um, yeah, so um, so there were a number of questions that have come through. Um, I think if we start with the ones um, that were mainly on on your on your area, um, Maria. Um, so you've said yes. So I think one of the the, the initial ones is is about carbon um, and and what what sort of carbon you, it is that you're talking about, whether it's um, operational carbon and embedded carbon, and um, whether carbon dioxide from processes is, is taken into account when when carbon is oxidised. So, um, yes, could you please uh, give a bit more information on that? Uh, of course, yes, I've tried to answer some of those. So, yeah, so in the roadmap, um, as I said in the beginning, the net zero ambition for 2030, this is very important, which is in 10 years time, basically, the boundary for the sector has been um, the operational emissions, basically. And the reason for that is because not it doesn't mean that companies haven't got um, targets, their own targets for capital carbon emissions. It's just that there are different levels of maturity of how companies, how best uh, they understand the capital carbon emissions, how they have started measuring those and reducing them. So the, in, to answer the question, um, the, op the operational emissions are, are within the boundary of the sector ambition by 2030. However, there have been uh, discussions uh, with uh, the companies in Water UK and other players around uh, how to best accelerate um, the the alignment, if you like, of a capital carbon and approach to capital carbon. So the sector is ready to address that and include it post 2030. When it comes to the process emissions, uh, we're talking about, I, th I think the question is around whether we have included the short cycled CO2 emissions from the for the treatment processes. Or are you referring for the methane and nitrous oxides? I don't know if um, somebody wants to clarify this, because the CO2 emissions in the wastewater from the wastewater treatment process are short cycled, and uh, at the moment they're not included in the carbon accounting workbook methodology. Uh, but the nitrous oxide and methane are included. I don't know, Priya, if you want to correct me to see if I said something inaccurate here. No, that's correct. I just tried to figure out which question. Um, it's the yeah so exactly that is that we have looked at kind of the short cycle co2 but it's not included within the kind of accounting workbook where the focus is on methane and nitrous oxide in the sense that it would be released yeah. to the atmosphere unless there is a view on the potential to capture that short cycle co2 yeah the potential to go to negative emissions so turning that short cycle co2 into long-term storage is one of the things that have been looked at Yep. Great. Thank you. So um, one of the other questions that's sort of a bit related to that um, was about the grass, uh, which was saying that um, there was a question about whether the purchase of green uh, green tariffs reduce the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the question was asking whether that could be that approach could be discussed in a little bit more detail, whether it's been assumed that all electricity which will be purchased from green sources and whether that's considered to be an appropriate way to decarbonize the industry. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, I'll have a go. Chris, if you want to have a go first, it's up to you. I mean, I don't mind. No, no, you go, and then I can jump in if okay. there's anything. Yeah. Right, this is a very interesting question, and uh, we have been having um, quite a lot of detailed discussions with the companies around this. Um, so... Yeah, so first of all, I would like to emphasize what I said earlier, that we're developing different pathways for the sector, meaning there is no one solution 
that dictates to all the companies you have to do this. The reason for the pathways is because uh, we need to have a flexible approach and things are changing and different companies have different priorities. So as a sector, we're developing different pathways. In, um, in uh, some of the pathways, we are considering a proportion of the electricity procured, purchased from renewable energy sources to be there because this is what has been happening. Um, this is to do with um, the allocation of rego certificates, basically, if we're allowed to do this or not. Uh, and the same with exporting renewable energy, because there are different approaches in Scotland, for example, as in England, according uh, for this point. But uh, I totally, uh, I just want to emphasize that we have been looking at also options of investing heavily in uh, renewable energy uh, systems to power um, the water sector's assets uh, through the technologies I mentioned, the solar, wind, hydro, but other, other more emerging uh, technologies, and obviously the biogas and the biomethane. So uh, to answer the question, it's not the answer to say we have decarbonized because we have purchased the green electricity. Um, also, don't forget there are the emissions associated with the transmission and distribution losses in the um, grid, basically. So even if you have a, a wind farm, for example, how many hundreds of kilometers away that generates, uh, well, uh, low carbon electricity, the transmission and distribution losses in the grid take into account the entire energy mix in the UK. Uh, Pris, I don't know if you want to mention anything around the anything around the certificates or anything around green purchasing in case I haven't covered anything. I don't know. No, I think you that's know? right. I think it's yeah. yeah. I think I think. Yeah, we, we've we've accounted for it because it's there. There's or there is this idea of the hierarchy, and it's not going to be something that a sector will rely on to decarbonize it. It's all about reducing first, and it is still considered something that's acceptable in the sense that it should promote the market for more renewables to be generated. But in the end, the sector is going to try and reduce its consumption and be self-sufficient in the renewables that it generates itself as well. Is the priority? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, there have been a number of questions about the roadmap and uh, whether it is applicable for the water companies and supply chains and contractors and um, the extent to which it reflects um, the, the high carbon input in major construction projects like uh, reservoirs. So, yeah, and water resource management plans, yeah. <laughs> I'm just smiling because we have been having exactly these conversations. I mean, um, I'll have a go and press if you want to add uh, things we have discussed recently around the big projects, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so absolutely. The main message here is that uh, the roadmap is for the sector. Um, the asset owners, of course, are the water companies. However, in order for all these measures and uh, the different enablers uh, to happen, it needs full alignment of the supply chain. It needs full uh, contribution from the supply chain. It's not just a matter of a water company procuring, you know, some solar panels and that's it. It's sorted. No, it's not. Um, and when it comes to the supply chain involvement, uh, I think I, I answered this um, in this question uh, to everyone, is that uh, we see it in two parts. So the first one is how the supply chain can actually help the companies when delivering their capital investment plans really challenge the root cause of the problem and the solutions, the outline solutions they have put on the table to come up with clever solutions to reduce um, the emissions. And the second one is how can the supply chain propose uh, different means, methods, technologies um, for companies to consider to implement uh, as part of those decarbonization clusters. When it comes to planning for major infrastructure, obviously this is definitely included in the net zero ambition and uh, especially for uh, water resource management plans that uh, we'll need to build quite a few things, new things. And this is an ongoing discussion that uh, the supply chain is actually key uh, to, to contribute to that change and, uh, and make sure any solutions going forward, especially schemes that are going to be in place for the next 100 to 100 years, are properly accounted for and uh, fall within the net zero boundary. Um, I don't know, Prish, if you wanted to add um, anything on that. Um, you don't have to, but <laughs> um, it's a tricky one. Yeah. No, yeah, it's a tricky one. And but yeah, I think all companies have also committed to the fact that there is lots of work 
ongoing and that is that capital infrastructure is going to be needed particularly for these water resources schemes i think our our view is kind of moving towards the like maria said taking on board and implementing a process that does look to decarbonize through the supply chain the delivery of these capital infrastructure projects as much as possible balancing out kind of whole life carbon i think some some projects are the right thing to do that add carbon but understanding how much they add and how you can decarbonize that as a systems piece and get net zero not necessarily zero carbon but where you will need to generate more electric more power or whether you need to decarbonize other parts of your operations to account for an increase in emissions from these strategic options is what needs to be considered better i think as well and that's what where, where the work is going into yeah Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I think if we now sort of move more um, onto the onto the specific sludge to um, sludge use in land and sludge management um, that you covered, um, there have been questions about uh, the greenhouse gas impact of treated sludge once it has been recycled, whether it's considered uh, neutral or whether it degrades further to. Um, Yep. CO2 and and also how it relates to the um, whether how in your calculations whether um, it, it um, you, you take into account chemical fertilizer and the com carbon footprint of that and yep. of um, soil conditioners. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's a good question. And yeah, the answer is that they do continue to degrade further, or yeah, they do break down further and do continue to release greenhouse gases. Um, the more the more stabilized the product you get, so the more volatile solids you break down during the treatment and capture the gas, the less they um, continue to release gases once they're recycled to land. Um, in terms of in the context of the route map, the once it leaves your boundary, it's outside of the numbers. So the numbers that have shown do not include do not, don't include for the kind of ongoing emissions from what's applied to land. Um, with, there is a view that there has been kind of I suppose individual company studies on how much they're recycling to land and what their kind of energy intensity of the equivalent fertilizers is, and that always looks favorable to the recycling to land kind of view. Um, so yes, the emissions continued in terms of the amount of additional benefit they provide in terms of soil conditioner compared to kind of manufactured chemicals. We do believe that there's, there is a kind of overall greenhouse gas benefit compared to those as well, but we haven't accounted for that in this route map at the moment. Does that answer the question? I think it sounds very comprehensive, yes. It's good, it's good, Bruce. Yeah, so that was good, yeah. 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 Um, so there was um, just uh, also on the on the sludge land um, point of view, uh, there's been a, a question in about northern uh, coming from Northern Ireland, um, where it's not possible to send a digestate sludge to to landfill. Um, not quite sure. Yeah. And so the question is. Um, yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, so if I if I go back to the kind of yeah, so this is where the idea of advanced thermal conversion technologies is that the kind of recycling to land and then also you don't want to put biological things into landfill because then you'll release methane through that process anyway. So this is where so currently a lot of the sludge in Northern Ireland is incinerated to a certain type of process. Um through mono incineration, I believe it is. But um that that would be where the idea is kind of of gasification or pyrolysis or something that converts it converts the what would you call the treated sludge so you would go through an ad system that recovers biogas but then you'd put your digestate through an advanced conversion process which would then turn it into biochar which is almost completely 100 percent kind of dry solids that is a more inert material you then recover something called syngas that you can potentially use to get even more energy generated and those are the kind of things that are being looked at in those situations and um, i think that's what you'd kind of see in european countries that also don't recycle to land as well is either they get mono mono incinerated or go through other advanced thermal conversion processes 
such as gasification or pyrolysis. So the idea there is, so giving a German example there would be, once you start not recycling to land, phosphorus is a really valuable product in terms of a finite resource. So one of the things that's happening in Germany is encouraging mono incineration of sludge, but then trying to recover phosphorus from sludge ash so that you still get the nutrients recycled, even if you don't recycle the sludge directly to land. Thank you. I think probably the last question, which we can probably um, fit in before we uh, wrap up, um, is one about bio resources market. Um, so the question is, what impact do you think the establishment of a bio resources market will have on carbon emissions? And will there be challenges yep. tracking emissions if the sector becomes more fragmented? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Paul. Um, do you want me to... <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think for the first thing is to say that how we've defined the boundary is based on what was considered the appointed business before PR19. So the bio resources section of the the um, kind of regulatory price control is still considered as part of the company boundary. However, yeah, there is this view that there'll be more entrants coming into the bio resources market that on one end might take substrate so sludge away from being treated by the companies and that's kind of a i suppose there's something there in terms of companies will have to balance out whether it's better off from a net zero perspective and a financial perspective letting someone else treat that sludge and whether they can then generate something that's more efficient and more power and whether then they take that power back as a renewable source so it's i think that comes into the accounting I think the bioresources market can be looked at both ways is it might become more difficult to account for and it might make it more fragmented. However, from a technological perspective, scale still seems to be the best way to go. So yeah. even if there are new entrants, scale is still going to be important. And you'd hope that anyone that can demonstrate a product or a technology that is so much more efficient that it justifies um those decommissioning existing assets and going somewhere new completely from a financial point of view has got a really good technology. So it's going to encourage, it's going to take a lot of innovation and get something really good to write off assets that water companies currently own and could probably more see companies coming in to operate and buy off their existing assets than companies buying back that power or whatever resources recovered. Yep. Absolutely, Chris. You're, you're spot on on this, and uh, and we've we've discussed uh, with uh, the companies this uh, this point, and we think on balance the opportunities are greater. Also, on the fact that uh, they may have access to much more accelerated funding uh, to progress with some of the things. Obviously, depending on the incentives, the relevant incentives that are in the market. But yeah, absolutely, as Chris says. There could be more burden on the reporting, uh, but overall, we think it's going to be a good, a great opportunity, actually. Well, thank you very much. That's that's been a very, very um, enlightening uh, discussion. Um, thank you very, both very much indeed. Um, there are several questions. I think we could keep going all afternoon, but it is um, approaching one o'clock. So I think we're going to have to going to have to stop. So, so once again, thank you very much indeed, Maria and Priyash, for a very very interesting talk and for very informative answers to to all the questions. Um, I think the um, the, uh, the the slides will be made available after after the after the session. Uh, I think people who have attended will be um, will be sent a link and it will be available through the through the IMECI website. Um, I think there are also other, if you, there are other similar webinars. So do please um, go to the Anarchy website um, and see what what else there is on 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 offer available to us. So uh, yes, so just thank you very both very much indeed. Um, very very good and informative. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.